Um, <laughs> so we are we are so lucky to have you all here. So I'll go through, and um, I, I won't do them justice because their scope of work is is deeper and wider than I could ever <laughs> say in the amount of time that we have. Um, but uh, we have a number of people. So we have Richard and Teresa Garcia. Um, Richard is the founder, executive director of the Colorado Parent Coalition, um, along with a much, much wider body of work. He's also on the um, school board for Boulder Valley School District. So we're very, very fortunate to have him. Um, Teresa is the coach you were at Uni Hill for how many years? 28. 28 years as a teacher at, at University Hill, if you're familiar with that bilingual school across the street from CU. Um, and also the curriculum writer and co-founder of the um, PASO program. Yeah, uh, the curriculum. The curriculum right. piece. That, that's and um, which she'll speak more to. Uh, Dor Dr. Doris Candelari, um, who was, we worked together at Sanchez International School but um, is of the recent fame of working at TU as faculty <laughs> there. Um, doing, and what's the name of your program? Educational Leadership and Policy mm -hmm. Studies. Studies. And um, then Rachel, oh my gosh, I just came to you. Fuchs. Thank you. Rachel Fuchs is the director for Intercambio, so if you're familiar with their work, they're very close by. The director um, of programs. Of programs. And then Lee Shanus is the yes. executive director. <laughs> but yes, she does, it helps unite all, all the uh, folks around friendship and language and culture here in Boulder <laughs> County. And then we have Donna Mejia, who's um, faculty at uh, C you are assist I always get this wrong, assistant or associate professor. That's no, okay, assistant. Assistant, okay, assistant professor um, at CU Boulder. And she is technically in the dance and theater department, but also teaches in gender studies and um, uh, ethic uh, and, and um, help me. Ethics ethics studies, studies, but I also do teach an ethics course. Okay, <laughs> I was say, I'm remembering <laughs> ethics, <laughs> <and> ethics <laughs> studies. And then we have a um, good friend and colleague, um, Nella Monero Goodwin, who not only has taught this course with us before, is very familiar, um, but is also uh, very intricately involved with mental health um, for young children and doing parenting work. Um, for families all around Boulder County and Denver, um, especially focusing on families whose native language is Spanish, um, and uh, has a radio show. Pasa la voz. Pasa la voz. Um, <laughs> in out of out of Denver yeah. on Sunday afternoons. Maybe you can listen okay. still. KGNU. KGNU. Um, so that is my speed drive by of like information, really quick information. Um, around our panel because I don't want to take any more time from them. Um, we're going to move into the discussion. So our first, we have four, only four guiding questions. And if we don't get to them all, um, that's okay. That might happen because we, we will allow you all to take us on some road trips um, to different areas <coughs> that seem interesting to you. But our first is to, to do an introduction, please, panel of your goal, role, and mission in the community within, with, with, in work, where you work. So Everyone your goal, your role, and mission. Slowly, so we can catch it that way. You can also post that announcement, but just, just so at least we get your first names if we have questions, we can ask you throughout the day. Yes, please. We are trying to do a recording. Um, Dane, where is the? It's right in the middle, right there. Okay, yes, Hopefully it's right down there. Audio. We've had some audio issues in the past, but at least there will be some sort of record. Of it. And if you need to glance, the questions are behind you. If you'd like to glance, but okay. Um, so please say your name, share your goal, role, and mission um, in the community in which you work. So start with uh, Richard. Would you be able to kick it off? Uh, no, I'm looking for the guiding questions. Oh, <laughs> we got them behind you, too. Oh, they're behind you, great. Yeah, there you go, now you're set. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. So, uh, first, uh, my name again is Richard Garcia. I'm the founder and executive director of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition, which is an organization that works to connect families with schools and provide tools that families need to be more effectively engaged with their students' education. 
And we go from preschool all the way to <coughs> whatever, okay? Uh, and uh, we've been around since 1980, so we've, we've got a lot of history uh, working with schools and uh, communities around family engagement. Uh, and uh, what else? I am on, also on the school board for Boulder Valley School District. Uh, been on there now, going on two years. Uh, spanking brand new. Uh, and uh, uh, I, and Teresa will probably talk a little bit about this, but I, I was also a trustee for the Community Foundation in Boulder County. And through that work, uh, we started looking at resident engagement as a process to uh, close the achievement gap in Boulder County. And through that whole process, we created what we called the School Readiness Initiative that has a number of components. Uh, one of them was the Engaged Latino Parents Advancing Student Outcomes, El Paso, which Teresa will talk about a little bit. Uh, but I was one of the founders of that particular program. Do I go through all of it? Or? I, I think it would take us all night. Think, no, just the first, just the first. Sorry. We'll have, um, we'll just go through the first one with everyone and then come back through. Okay, so, sorry, I didn't put it up. Teresa, you know, being a teacher forever, you have yeah, to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good evening, or good afternoon, good evening. My name is Teresa Garcia. Um, yes, I was, uh, I was very fortunate to be a teacher for 28 years in Boulder Valley School District in at University Hill, exactly. And I was also a teacher in Mexico, in Oaxaca. So I, I was able to see the difference in, in how our Latino children work and learn and, and uh, are ready to move into the, the success of the uh, school when they are ready from the beginning. What I, it says here, share your goal. Yes, I work right now in a, in a program called El Paso and uh, the one that Richard founded. El Paso is a program that really dedicates itself to support every single parent that wants to with information to give their child the possibility and all the opportunities to succeed in school. My goal my goal is to make sure that every child, every Latino child in Boulder County gets to have a home where they read, where they talk, where they converse, where they ask questions. In that way, that child is ready to succeed in preschool and kindergarten. Logically, if you do that at the beginning, you're going to be successful. You have big, big percentage of possibilities of being successful for the rest of your life. That's my goal. The reason why is my goal is because I was a teacher. And as a bilingual teacher at University Hill, I had 50% of my students who were Latino, Spanish-speaking students, Latino. And I have the 50% of my students were English speakers. And those could be uh, uh, Anglo students or African American students or, or Latino students who only speak English. Throughout the years, I will pull my hair, I will go nuts trying to figure out what is going on, why our kids are not doing better. And guess what? After I retire, I think <laughs> I found the answer. So, there. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me tonight. It's so fun. I, I mean, I, I guess when you think about what is your goal, your role, and your mission, and this opportunity to just sit for a minute and say, oh, yeah, what is that? I want to just reflect back on Doris Candelari, uh, formerly was the principal at Alicia Sanchez International School. And, um, you know, I can say, and currently now, I'm in faculty at the University of Denver teaching teachers how to then become principals. And so, you know, my goal has always been in education. I've never, even as a teacher, I worked, I was a teacher for 
Oh my gosh, now this really dates me. I was an elementary teacher for 10 years, a middle school teacher, um, back and forth for around two years, and then became an educational leader from there on, but 30 years in public education. And my goal has always been breaking the cycle of poverty through education. And um, within that, though, you know, always having this mission around engaging parents and family and community. And it's so fun tonight to see Richard and Teresa because, and also Rachel from Intercombio, I, as the principal at Sanchez, I had partners with Richard's um, Parent and Family Coalition and then with El Paso and also with Intercombio. So that piece around the mission of engaging families I have to say, I never have ever met a parent who didn't want the best for their child. Even in their worst place mm -hmm. in their lives, you know, even at their darkest moments, they still always want the best for their children. And so I would have to say in my role, you know, as an educational leader and teaching educational leadership now, I'm always focused on how, how can we partner together to achieve that ultimate goal of every child being successful. And I would have to say, especially children who haven't had all the opportunities that other children have had, or who have circumstances in their lives that prevent them from accessing those opportunities. And so figuring out how to break down those barriers that we have in our systems so that they can access those opportunities. Um, so that's what I would have to say, regardless of the role, it still always comes back to breaking that cycle um, for me. Um, and having worked with Ashley at Sanchez, you know, building a family resource center that still exists today, I mean, 10 years later, sustainability is a huge factor in all the work that you do, whether, you know, in leaving that legacy. So that's what I'd have to say. Doris Candelari. I'm Rachel, uh, Rachel Fuchs, and I'm with Intercombio Uniting Communities. Um, we, our, our vision is communities um, where all members communicate, connect, and succeed. And we are looking at partnership and parent involvement, or uh, uh, student success really through the lens of parents. Um, so supporting adult immigrants to learn English, um, to connect with their communities, to feel empowered that they have the, um, the right to connect with, with the broader community, um, and also navigate systems within, um, within those communities. And for a lot of folks, those <coughs> systems um, are connected to schools, so school districts. Um, we uh, provide this English education through volunteers. So we train volunteers to teach English, and, and the reason we do that is because we know that communities are stronger when all community members have an opportunity to make connections and cross-cultural connections, whether that's um, ethnicity, uh, professional background, uh, country of origin, uh, economic status, all of those are cultural groups that we feel it's really important to, to aim to build bridges. Hi, I'm Donna Mejia, and I've been sitting here listening to these articulate people trying to figure out how to, in a nutshell, tell you what the hell I am. <laughs> so here's my, my stab at it. My goal, first of all, I'm a professor at CU Boulder but I'm also a professional artist still touring and doing my thing in the field. So one foot in the commercial arena, one foot in the educational arena. Um, and I also straddle a couple of disciplines, so I'm very interdisciplinary and intersectional in how I proceed with my research. My research deals with fusion and overlapping identities. I myself am a person of mixed ethnicity. I'll let you figure out that mystery. <laughs> and. Uh, and I have been, I would say my goal as an educator is to foster in very real, grounded, and tangible ways multiple intelligences. My goal is to create evolved humans who are capable of having a somatic intelligence about them that matches their intellectual and cognitive capacities. And so I do that through many means, and I have um, 
a philanthropic wing for my work called the Sovereign Collective. Um, so you can go to the Sovereign Collective at DonnaInTheDance.com. And we are Movement Arts, and I'll read so that I don't ramble. We are a Movement Social Arts Action Collective, um, and members have pledged to elevate social consciousness towards a reverent connection to the human body. The project began as an effort to mobilize concerned citizens around an issue that can seem too large for an individual to take on, sovereignty of the human body. The collective was founded in Northampton, Massachusetts, and now operates as a network of individuals across the country. We address transgressions against physical self-determination that manifest across international, cultural, religious, political, and economic lines in a, multiple, in a multitude of practices. Anything from genital mutilation, legally sanctioned infantile marriages, elder abuse, sexual servitude, censorship of sexual information, slavery, honor killings, media influence distortions of body image, domestic violence, military torture, inaccessibility to affordable health care, forced medical intervention or end of life management, and the list goes on. And on, and on. So secretly I'm a dance instructor, <laughs> but super subsecretly I'm a political activist about the body. Give us that website one more time. Yes, uh, my website is DonnaInTheDance.com. In the dance. And uh, the tab is the Sovereign Collective. Now it's time for me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my name is Marinela Manero Goodwin. Um, I am a psychologist. Um, I helped to teach this class last summer. Last, last summer, last summer. Last last summer. summer. Yeah. It was fun. Now I am in this side of the room. Um, I think, you know, thinking about everything that uh, the people say here, I will say that it's a part that I dedicate my, my time, um, you know, working with families, especially with Latino parents, um, in develop and understand the social emotional piece in their children and in themselves. Um, I believe that, of course, every single thing that we said here um, are so important. And we need parents that are present, they are centered, they are connected with the children. And that is part of my goal. I teach uh, parenting classes and I love to teach um, something that you can uh, also research is uh, parenting from inside out. Uh, is, is try to make sure that every child not only has the opportunity to learn, um, but also have a, an adult in their life that can understand them they can connect with them, they can, they can also reinforce what they are doing, um, make their children safe. Um, that is why I, I have been teaching, like I said, parenting classes and also I am a therapist for a program that, um, here in, the, in Boulder County is community infant program that we, um, uh, we dedicate our time to teach parents to uh, develop and um, be aware of the attachment with their children. And we, we know uh, that that is uh, the base for everything else. When we see the world around, we, we notice that most of the problems that we have, of course, uh, everything, again, this we said here, but also it's because we are not um, emotionally intelligent sometimes. Mm -hmm. That we, we uh, Sometimes we, we can, you know, read and write and do everything else, but we don't know how to relate with, all, with, your, with others. Mm -hmm. And that is why we, we see all the, you know, un injustice and other things that we, we see around this county and around the world, of course. That is my role, how I can support parents, especially the uh, Spanish-speaking speak, uh, parents, to parenting from inside out to connect with their children and to be aware of their emotions and how that impact the children um, now and in the future. Okay, I'm going to just bring up the next question. Thank you all so much. Okay, so 
This one, please just, we won't, we won't go down the line, but as you feel like your answer comes to you, um, please talk about how you would define community. Okay, and I'm going to try and get the air going a little more, else we're going to be sharing Donna's fan all the way down the line. All right, so please share how you would define community. Whoever's ready, jump in. Who's well, ready? Richard. I think I'm the oldest guy here, so okay. I'll, I'll do that. I'll let you have it. Thanks, Richard. Uh, community, for me, I define it as a place where things are shared, uh, a, where you can share uh, many different things like knowledge, skills, um, you help each other out, you help your neighbor, uh, your friend, your family, uh, and there are really no strings attached to the sharing that goes along with community. Uh, and it's all for the good of everybody in that particular community. Uh, that's how I define it, you know, and I'm going to just say a couple, one more thing before I be quiet. Um, when I work with the Latino community, okay, uh, I often talk about the changing demographics in the United States of America. If you look at the trends in terms of the population and where it's going, and this is what I tell my community when I talk with them, that by the year 2050, the Latino community is going to be one third of the population in the United States. Say the year again, 2050 or 2050? 2050. That's not too far away. And we also know that in our community, the Latino community, you're looking at a dropout rate that far exceeds the dropout rates of other communities with the exception of probably the Native American community. You also see a wide achievement gap and in Boulder County you have the widest achievement gap in the state of Colorado between Latino kids and their Anglo peers. So when I talk about the population trend in terms of 2050 we have a responsibility in the community for the community of all, and that is to make sure that our kids get the education that they need, because by 2050, you have an aging population in the white Anglo community, okay? And if we don't educate the, these kids and do a good job about it, we're gonna be losing out because we're gonna need, need more teachers. If you look at the teaching pool, in, in, in the state of Colorado, or in the United States, it's declined, it's decreasing. Uh, so you're gonna need more teachers, you're gonna need more lawyers, you're gonna need more doctors, scientists, all of that. <coughs> Who's gonna fill the void if it's not going to be the Latino community? So that's, that's something that I just wanted the group here to know because that, to me, is also a self-motivator in terms of light bulbs going on, in terms of parents, you know, that may not know that information, and they say, oh, wow, I have a big responsibility to the community. And that is to make sure that my kids go to school, they learn, and that I participate in the activities of the school, and I do all the good things that I need to do to make sure that that child of mine finishes high school and then goes on to be better and, uh, and do wonderful things in, in uh, uh, society. So, anyway, sorry. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. If I could just piggyback on what Richard said. I <clears throat> like what he said about the no strings attached. And I think of community as a collective. And um, there's this collective, and whether it's, you know, a community that's a family, a community that's a neighborhood, a community that's a classroom, a community that's a school, that there's voice and opportunities for engagement and I also think of this collaborative efforts that go on around it 
And then I would also add that as far as schools go, I used to always say, so goes the school, so goes the community. And that if you don't have a relationship with your community, both ways, it's a two-way street, that the school is engaged with the community and the, the community is engaged with the school for the greater good. So there's this greater good element related to that. And then I think about um, community and I think about what somewhat is attached to it is the word partnership. So it's the communities and partnerships and you know that your work with the littles, as I call them, and the work with the littles, in, in, that's their first experience with a community for a lot of parents and families. So, you know, they might have a church community and they have their neighborhood community, but that organized, systemic community. So it's such a great opportunity to reframe maybe some notions that they might have of what a community is. I just want to go okay. okay, so I, I love that definition also. For me, community is like a, a, a puzzle. It's like an organic puzzle that is moving and transforming constantly because that's what's happening to our communities. And every one of us has a piece, and we all want to be part of that, that, that puzzle. We want to form it. We want to make sure that our work, our part, our piece actually integrates and makes it even better. But there are a lot of pieces missing. In the community, there are a lot of pieces missing. Or there are pieces that don't fit. Or there are places in the puzzle that don't allow any more pieces, even if the pieces are still around. Mm -hmm. To me, a community brings within the possibility of being better. It's not, well, we're just gonna, gonna let that guy come in because he's gonna make it better. No, I, I'm already part of the community. I have to make it better. And that person wants to come, let's, let's let it be in here. And hopefully it will make it better. And because it's organic, it's constantly transforming and changing, and it's constantly requiring of all of us to move with it to a better place. To me, community is having each one of us with that little piece that can be emotional or mental or physical or work. It can be in any way. It has to be something that is going to make the place better and it's going to make the people around, the pieces around me better. Have you noticed how when you, you are working in a puzzle, in the moment that you put that piece, the picture just comes to life? Can you imagine if all of us can go with that little piece and put it in? the little kid that comes in from the school and puts his little piece and can see that he or she has made that part, that classroom, that family, that playground, that zoo, anywhere, even better. That's what happens when you have a, a piece that completes or adds to the picture of a puzzle. We are a community that requires, that needs, all those other pieces. So we need to be more open. And many of you look like you're an amazing group of educators. I personally think that we are pieces of a puzzle that are so open and so willing to support and make the picture better. But I, I'm always thinking that way. So to me, a community is constantly moving. It can be just sitting there. I will add to, <laughs> to Teresa's definition is the uh, two things that I believe have to be uh, in a community is the, the feeling of belonging, that we are part of something that we believe as an individual, that we are part of this big picture, and also the trust. I think uh, in order to have a community, I have to feel that I really belong, I really can contribute, and also I can trust. 
uh, the other pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. that Teresa mm -hmm. talked about. Thank you. I don't. I don't have a whole lot to add. That's that's how I define my community as well. Um, so what I'll add is I thought about what um, kind of what makes a successful community, and and then also to 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 slightly alter um, the definition. In my perspective, a community comes together for some shared purpose. Um, so whether that's geographical or cultural, um, and when I say cultural, I I think it's really important that. That you know, I'm not defining culture in terms of country of origin. I think we have a tendency to do that when we talk about culture, but culture is so much broader than that. Um, it's about you know the type of neighborhood we grew up in. It's about the type of food we eat. It's about the um, type of hobbies that we have. The type of education that we got. So all of that is related to culture. And when we come together with some sort of shared purpose, I think that creates a community. And um, like trust and like the feeling of belonging, uh, I think a successful community hinges on the ability to define that shared purpose. So when communities um, <coughs> don't feel successful or there's no space for the extra puzzle piece, I, I think sometimes that's a factor of, of the lack of identification of why are we together. Or assuming that a community exists when it doesn't exist. Thanks for those additions, Donna. And that segues perfectly into the little subversive things that I wanted to say. <laughs> because um, all of you have described what I believe is my ideal community. Absolutely. And I agree with all of the panelists. I think what I observe at this time uh, is um, I mean, what I wish for would be a sense of belonging and reflection from a community. But from what I have found in my research, reflection is not necessarily given in geographic proximity. And in every community that we try to engage within geographic proximity, we are dealing with misshapen or misformed or different puzzle pieces that don't align, right? And so then we get into a situation where a community becomes weaponized against someone. And um, we're dealing with communities that are very self-regulating through um, the establishment of mores and norms and accountability and the imposition of shame. And so when you're getting to communities being weaponized because people don't fit in, um, that's when we're dealing with um, humans not rising to the occasion of supporting each other and being their best. And so for me, community is about reflection, even if that reflection is not in your immediate proximity, and the ability to know that you're not alone. And sometimes it means helping community members understand that even though they may not reflect everything around them, that's saying this is the norm, this is the norm, this is the norm, this is the expectation. You as an educator have a way to say, I see you. I see what you're interested in. I see what you crave. I see what you need. Can I help you start some investigations and to involve parents or to let people know that um, communities should be breathing organisms that are constantly stretching and growing and changing and um, umbrella-like rather than union forming? Thank you for those additions. So, you know, Dave, I think it would be this place, I'd love to open up to the class if there are any questions or, or detours you'd like to take before we we move to the next. There's so much here, um, but, but if there's something that you all are thinking or would like to ask, give you that opportunity. Yeah, please. Uh, Donna, is it Mejia? Mejia. Um, definitely bringing people to the commonality of 
being physically embodied. And so I, <laughs> dance is like the great equalizer because it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with um, athletic talent. It has more to do with the courage to express and bringing people to the table for that conversation and giving them the courage to find their way through a classroom of moving means that they are managing mathematical complexity of music, coordination on a neurological level. Um, they're dealing with all the filters that are arising about embarrassment and shame of moving in front of others if they've been taught that they're not supposed to or that there's something unbecoming about them. Um, and so I feel like I get these really intellectually rich young people at the collegiate level every year and then all of a sudden they're reduced to zero when we get them in a classroom and say, okay, now follow this beat, follow this pattern, move across the room and coordinate it with your classmates. And so I just decided many, many years ago that my goal would not be to create more performers, it would be to uh, create human beings that knew how to dialogue with their bodies and use that as part of their problem solving in the world. Um, so that means how to sense consent, how to sense um, comfort in the body, uh, how to self-soothe without going immediately to chemicals, caffeine, and alternate substances that are destructive to the body. But really seeing the body as an ally to intellectual life as opposed to um, an obstruction. So for me, um, how do I do that? I start with the journey of taking people into their senses in the classroom first and showing them the commonalities and then we talk about how we perceive things differently through our senses. But we all have different ways of mapping our senses. And then from there I try to get them familiar with an inner landscape, kind of the texture of their inner world, the weather inside, and make it okay. Um, so that whatever they're feeling on a given day doesn't have to be changed, they just have to acknowledge it and be truthful about it. And then from there, the body-mind connection tends to get its own path going, because I'm going to keep this super short, sorry. So you have this mind-body connection, and you can meditate for a few hours and lower your blood pressure, right? Or you can dance and physically move and create more ease and coping skills in the mind by creating a transformative experience with your thinking. So you can physically or mentally hijack and hack that formula from either side. So for me, teaching people with their bodies to be artful, to be expressive, to be physical, along with their intellectual experience, gives them a new tool set to problem solve and you know when we up at the university the day after the election it was really interesting to see people around um, there were literally puppy piles of people crying and and struggling to understand how this would impact the world that they were trying to build these young people mm -hmm. and the first thing we did is we started moving and by the end of it um, it was tremendous to see the courage and the um, the fear that people had been able to process in an hour that they had been sitting with you know for 12 hours crying and within an hour they're like okay I got my sassy on I'm ready to go mm -hmm. and so I feel like there's knowledge that the body presents that is not accessible just through intellectual channels but, but I'd love to explore empathy that idea of empathy a little bit more in the panel I know Donna's focus is dance and arts and some of that exploration it's interesting how we do lead those are often the first programs that are cut from schools when funding gets tight. That's just an interesting um, disassociation between mind and, and body that can occur. But um, uh, any other of the panel members that would like to speak to that question of, of developing empathy to, to create community? I'll share about that. Um, we, um, empathy is something that we talk about a lot as a program. and. It's our belief that empathy, that the creation of empathy relies on people coming together and learning from one another um, and knowing one another, that there's lack of empathy when we make judgments about people. And oftentimes, 
I, mean, I, I hate blanket statements, but I will provide one. I think that uh, that judgments almost always come from a lack of knowledge about somebody. And so in order to avoid that and, and create empathy between people, they need to know each other. And one area where we often see that disconnect or that lack of empathy is between people who don't share a common language um, for you know, kind of the obvious reasons of you can't talk, to, you can't verbally communicate um, with somebody when you don't share that um, oral language. And so by, by providing, and at the same time, you know, it's, it's unrealistic to say, you know, just, well, just get over the discomfort. Just go meet somebody. It doesn't matter if you don't speak their language. There are a lot of uh, kind of affective barriers that keep us from doing that. And so by um, providing people a meaningful opportunity to connect with that shared goal of teaching or learning a language, um, you know, that's what we, we say our volunteers are teaching a language and our students are learning a language, our, our learners are learning a language, but, you know, that's just on the surface. It's really this mutual learning across a, a really obvious and real barrier. Um, so you have people connecting who do not share a common language. Um, and um, our, uh, most of our classes are taught one-on-one -on -one, um, in people's homes. So, you know, whole, wow. <laughs> like, when do, you, when do you ever go into the home of somebody who you, you know, barely know, you don't share that, that common language? That provides an avenue for understanding. And I see the lack of understanding on both sides. Um, I think there's an assumption that the, the lack of understanding is from the kind of the dominant community, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. Um, I think there's, you know, there's that, um, that, that we need to, we need to explore ways to build empathy from all angles. I would like to go after you. Uh, you know what, in my experience as a teacher, uh, I always notice, and very similar to what you just said, that if you have two kiddos or two parents or two human beings, and you put them together with a common goal, we have to finish this event, we have to prepare, and they don't speak the same language, or they are not in the same grade, or they are not even at the same school, and they have to work through no, because the ob objective is for them to get to know themselves, to try to solve a problem is a bigger issue. And as they are trying to solve the problem and finish and get to their goal, they go through those stages that first is the awareness, oh, this is, this is another person that does this differently from me speaking or dressing or looking, skin, whatever, accent, it doesn't matter. After that comes the knowledge, not just the awareness, but the knowledge, oh, oh, I see. I know why, well, we don't know yet, but I know why you look that way. I think you come from a little bit from here. I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> you come from this country or that country or whatever. Then after that knowledge, comes this acceptance because I see that the reason why you laugh that way or you make that face or you make those gestures is not because you don't like me or because you want to be mean. It's a totally different aspect of your life and I begin to understand. So before you have to, before you have to accept or you, you want to accept, it, it, it's logical as human beings, you want to first, oh, you are here, and I'm acknowledging you. Oh, I, I guess you, you have certain things that are different from me. I'm getting to know you. And as we move forward with this crazy goal that we have to reach, comes this other piece that said, your differences and your and similarities are actually something that I can live with. And then when you finish the project, doesn't matter what, you become sensitive. 
we all become sensitive to because it's, it's, it's everywhere around myself or other people that are different from me or, or you toward other people all of us are different and not getting to know the other person with other goals that really in my classroom year after year and as an assistant principal with our parents year after year in pto meetings when parents of other cultures were Oh, well, we want the Latino parents in our committee, but now they're here, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> you don't have to do anything with them. They are as scared as you are. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's talk about that fear, because their fear comes from somewhere else, mm -hmm. and your comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Once they started talking and we created these this, this, uh, conversations, sensitivity, and what happens after, after sensitivity? Hello? <laughs> Nothing? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. But you, can't, you can't help it not to do it. Yes, you're right. Sensitivity brings the it's empathy that I worked with somebody like that. I understood if we took the time not to get to know, but to try to get that goal reached. And that took us to that point. It's very important that even young kiddos see us doing that. I'm going, as kiddos, look at us. We have to show them how sensitivity looks like and how respect looks like and how patience looks like and then the kids are going to learn from us. And they're going to go through their own stage. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, can I jump to Nella? Sure. 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 I know. I she was, she was <laughs> no, I, I, you know, empathy is a topic that we can have another panel to talk about. <laughs> the entire night. Um, yes. But I would say that in my experience working with parents, I believe that empathy is a skill that you learn, and you start learning that at home. Um, definitely, I mean, I think that is the bottom line for me. Yeah. Uh, if you have parents or you have uh, family, the, uh, the way they, to relate with each other is from power and control, mm -hmm. and you have to be the way that we expect for you to be, and we don't abs accept our own family, I think you cannot go beyond that to the schools. So, I mean, it's going to take more effort. Um, that is why I feel like it, we have to start uh, teaching children, with our example, of course, what, what is empathy, what that means, how you, um, not, not even uh, in, in, in words and lectures, it's more about how we relate with each other. Because something that we also experience working in bilingual schools is that as a parent, we send our children to the bilingual schools and we say, okay, you have to be, you know, uh, relate with each other and mm -hmm. communicate and have friends, but any uh, I I was and maybe you have the same impression. Uh, parents don't don't communicate with each other. Don't uh, have crossing like crossing the, languages and crossing cultures. No, they are they send their children and they stay in their own bubble. And I think that is why I feel like uh, empathy is the the root of you know any kind of uh, communication, respect, no judgment. Richard, please. Just let me add, because uh, what you were saying, Nella, kind of brought this in my mind, and I agree with everybody, what everybody said, but when I look at empathy, I really have to look at my own privilege, you know, where I'm coming from. If I'm to empathize with somebody else, I really have to look at me, myself first, because sometimes that privilege can get in the way of really establishing empathy with somebody else. Uh, so what does that mean, you know, when you when you start looking at what is my own privilege and how does that get in the way? Mm -hmm. You know, I think only the person, the, the self, can answer that. You know, what is my privilege? How was I? How did I grow up? Uh, how does that relate to uh, the families that I'm working with? Do I really truly understand 
issues that they're dealing with right now. Uh, there's there's tons of issues that, especially if you're working in schools where there's where it's impacted by low-income families, you know you really have to start looking at your own privilege first before you even start thinking about establishing empathy. So I, I wanted to just add a couple of things. That's what a powerful conversation we just heard on empathy. Um, now I think, yes, we do need to teach it in schools, and it starts with the littles and giving them you know, opportunities to practice empathy. Um, but I also think that as adults, as Teresa was saying, you know, to have some experiences. Like people won't change. Adults won't change their behavior. Well, actually, any, no one will change their behavior unless they have a reason to change that behavior. And typically what drives a behavior change is an emotional experience. And so if there's some sort of an emotional experience to get to that connection, that awareness, that understanding, so providing, to build community, is providing that opportunity for those experiences, whether it's working with the children or working with the parents of the children. So how can you set up those opportunities to have those kinds of experiences where people can really see each other and understand that humanness, that connection. Yes, while appreciating differences, but also appreciating the humanness of each other. And it makes me think about the idea of Ubuntu, which is an African saying that means, I am because you are. And so that parents could see that I am because you are. We're both parents here with the children, or you know, I am a teacher with your children because you are a parent of those children. And really to build that kind of community that we started defining at the very beginning of this is it, you know, it just takes that thinking about how can I purposely create experiences for this community to evolve. And just to add on that, there's another added value that we have through El Paso and Paso, and that is, don't do for me without me. Mm -hmm. that, Richard, that's, that's a really important point. So, you know, we've talked a bit about like our intentions with teaching in terms of really connecting with families through not telling their story for them, allowing them to tell their own stories. Um, and, and so can you speak to that for that idea for just a minute? Absolutely. I know we, we, we've had some experiences here in this district and also in this county where we, we meaning uh, good people, wonderful people with beautiful intentions, uh, but they're, you know, because, you know, one of the things that we do is we talk about grass tops and grass shoots and then grass roots. So when you're looking at grass roots and you're looking at grass tops, who are the ones that are making decisions if it's not the grass top? Meaning your school superintendents, your board of education, uh, those types of folks. They're making decisions that affect a lot of people. Uh, but they make decisions in isolation because they never go to the grassroots and they ask them, what really do you need? Or can you come to the table and help us develop something that would really work for everyone? So we, we're failures in that respect, that we don't involve families at the very beginning, at the very get-go. It's only afterwards that we start thinking, ah, oh, mm -hmm. wow, you know? I should have asked you, what is it that you needed? Because, you know, and, and I know this happens a lot in our school systems. And I often talk about if you're going to have a party and you create the party and you design the party on your own, you're not going to have a whole lot of people come to your party. But if you create a party and you invite people to help develop the party and create the party with you, you're going to have a lot of people come to you. Look at quinceañeras as an example. Quinceañeras in the, in the Latino community are created with a lot of people involved. There was just a, a quinceanera a couple of weeks ago that my wife attended. You know how many people were at a quinceanera? 600. Wow. At a quinceanera. 600. 
but that was not done because that family was doing it by her, by herself. It was a community that created that quinceanera. So, you know, it's not, it's so when I say do for me, don't do for me without me, that's what I mean, you know, br bring people to the table from the very, very beginning and include them in the process. Why is that important for teachers? I'm asking. <laughs> to, make <laughs> <meaningful>. <laughs> to make learning experiences meaningful. Right. Uh, and ownership. And I heard someone say trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And commitment. So if you have a, a community of families in your classroom and you uh, want ownership in whatever you do, you really have to involve them in that process, whatever it is. Okay? And I know there are certain things that obviously you can't involve them because the curriculum is set by a higher authority, you know, and you have to follow curriculum. But there are certain activities that you can do and then bring the families and help them or help, have them help you in the development of those kinds of things. Jane, did you have a question? Sam, I have a question. Sam, you have a question? Okay, great. Yeah. I, I, I really think you partially addressed, but I, I, just, I just think it's worth asking it also. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm a cis white male, and I come from a lower middle class background, but I want to make a difference, and I don't want to do it without overstepping my boundary as an ally. How should people who want to identify as an ally operate so that they don't appropriate um, or step on another culture's um, struggle. Can offer a resource for you. Yeah. There's an article, So You Call Yourself an Ally, 10 Things All Allies Need to Know, which uh, it's on everydayfeminism.com. But this article brings together several other resources internationally of how to engage a community and yet not assume to speak for the community. And the number one thing that is said across all the research is listen first. Mm -hmm. That your listening skills are a more powerful weapon than your speaking skills mm -hmm. when you're outside of your own birth community. Um, that listening first is being an ally. Uh, but again, the name of the article is, So, You Call Yourself an Ally, colon, 10 Things All Allies Need to Know. So you can Google that and pull it up. It's a free PDF you can find online. What, what's your name again? My name's Sam. Sam. What you just said just now, I think, is the first step, <laughs> really, is to acknowledge your own sense of being, your own privilege, if you will, mm -hmm. and then start from there. Uh, I think that's going to give you a whole lot of trust and maybe develop better relationships with your community. If you go in there with that thought in your head saying, hey, I'm a white, middle class, whatever you said, cis male, uh, but I want to do something. I need your help. You know, I think if you just acknowledge that, I think you're going to have all kinds of people trying to help you. Somebody about your book. I'm just curious. Um, uh, several months ago, I was having breakfast with my mom and her peers that are 82. And I asked them the question um, what is their role in the community of education? Um, so we talked about. Um, the difference of language and what a barrier that is. How can we support our overall community when we have an aging population and um, young children that are stuck or trapped in the system that um, they don't have any control over? You know, expectations of what you know, adults think children should have or be, and they're not there, and um, what kind of conversations would you have with 
uh, other adults in supporting young children. I was just going to say, we talked earlier about partnerships and um, we were just talking earlier about what do you do when you're retired? Well, we go to work. So, um, but I think at some point in my life, I'd like to be that retired where I go back into the schools. Um, and as a grandparent of five littles myself, you know, I think about what my role is. But in a big picture way, there's a lot of people <coughs> who love to go and engage in the school. And we did a lot of different work at Sanchez with partnering with the community to come into the school, whether it was a, you know, uh, someone coming in to read with children or to play games with them or, you know, to give them that opportunity to re-engage with the schools, with small children. So I think there's lots of people at all different ages that would love to partnership with the schools, but no one's ever asked. And so how do you ask? How do you go out there and say, hey, we'd love to have you come join our school? Or, and maybe, it, you know, sometimes grandparents don't get that ask even for the, you know, the school that their, ch their grandchildren are in if they have that availability. And so we often don't think of them as a resource, yet they're an amazing resource. I mean, thank goodness my mother's still alive and she's engaging with her great grandchildren. And that's just another form of community that brings with it a wealth of resources and connection to kids. And voting power. And, and, and Richard, that's why I looked at you, Richard. What, I was what, like, oh, the voting. Please. One, of the, one of the most important things that I didn't say is that I'm a, a father, I'm a grandfather, and I'm a great-grandfather. So I have six children, I have 15 grandchildren, I have eight great-grandchildren. And I'm only 10. No. <laughs> but, but that's a great question you asked as it, as it relates to the elders, you know, because uh, in, in different communities, you know, uh, elders are respected. They're held as high, in a very high esteem. Uh, and, uh, and and the young ones uh, respect that very much. And, you know, when I was growing up, uh, my grandmother, she was a storyteller. And, uh, and I think a lot of the things that, that I learned was through the stories that she would tell me. And I think that's a lesson for me because that's what I'm going to try and do with my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids. As a matter of fact, I've been attempting to write a book of my life, you know, so that I can pass it on. And it's just going to be for my family, it's not going to be for anybody else. Uh, so that they can really learn, you know, what, what my story is or was. Uh, and, uh, and pass it on to them. Uh, but, you know, short of, of being involved in the school, doing all those wonderful things that a lot of elders do, uh, uh, you know, just being in your own place and, 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 you know, trying to figure out what is that I can do because, you know, at some point you get to an age where you're not as mobile, you're not as, as uh, as free to do everything that you need to do, but you know, the young kids still go to the house to still go to to visit grandma, great grandma, or whatever. And I think that's the for me. I think that's the opportunity to tell those stories. I have three. three oh, somebody. Mm -hmm. Just wait. you and Donna, and then okay. unless there's another burning desire, we'll go to the next question. Okay, three three very specific things that their grandmothers and grandparents can do. Um, even in, in bilingual schools, we need ears. We need a, a nice, wonderful, warm body to go and sit next to Juanito and listen to him read in, in the period of English reading. We need, because even if we want to cut ourselves in 10 pieces, we can. And we need somebody to listen to that little kid. No criticize, no correct, 
that they can just to read and to to speak and talk about that story. That's phenomenal because they become friends. The other one is that uh, many of our adult um, years in this society and many, many others, and I know Richard just said, said about societies that are very wonderful with their uh, uh, um, their, uh, their, what, their elders. However, uh, many of our societies are not. So we adults have to give, a, a, again, the example or have to give that respect and have to listen to our, our grandparents. And in the schools, we have that, we used to have also, probably they still have it at Uni Hill, that program where the elders will come, whoever wanted, and tell their stories. Everybody, you all have amazing stories. Everybody has incredible stories uh, to tell. And you can imagine how wonderful it is when you have a person from Russia, uh, descended from Russia, or a person that says, yeah, I, I was in, in Germany. And the kids go, oh, yeah. you know, they can't believe they are, they, somebody's there. All those moments get lost because we don't, we, we don't uh, reach out in that incredible department of history. And we need to bring it, but we at all need to give them the example of how to listen to the story. And the other little part is that it's wonderful to have the elders being at the presentations of the kids. When we have, for example, oh, today is a big play or something, and we have two, three adults uh, or, or elders they see things that us as teachers or educators don't see. I have gotten, well, not me, my kids, my students got really wonderful uh, comments from the elders because they saw their things, or oh, they will tell the stories. Oh, when I was a little girl, we didn't do that. We didn't have all this techno stuff. We did this and that and that. The kids feel the excitement of history. so. I, I, I love your question, and I hope uh, you go and, and reach out and tell your, your relatives there is a lot to do, and there are a lot of little kiddos waiting. Okay. John, did you, did you want to jump Just in a real here? quick, yeah, yes to all of the above, mm -hmm. yes to all of it. And when I, I do a lot of uh, community engagement and outreach performances that are free for the, all age groups, and what I always prep my assistants and my comrades to help me with is reverence and humor when it comes to intergenerational learning. That feathers will get ruffled, people will offend each other, and things will be said. So reverence for humans and their experiences and the path that they've walked, and humor <laughs> so that you have the attitude that they could not possibly offend you, no matter how outrageous they get the kids and the elders, that everyone can go off the map and we're going to keep our sense of humor the whole time. <laughs> and uh, with that, we have a beautiful saying that I got from my dance mentor, Letitia Williams, many years ago. It's a Ghanaian saying, when an elder dies, it's as if an entire library has burned. Mm -hmm. uh, that oh, there that makes me want to cry. <laughs> that one got me. <laughs> There's context that mm -hmm. elders bring, but there is an unfiltered truth that youth bring that has not been poisoned by the well just yet. And so to get groups together is so valuable. And to have those intergenerational exchanges, they're messy, but they're delicious. So I highly recommend letting truth, humor, and reverence guide you in those experiences. Wonderful. I think, yeah, let's do four. I was going to Dave, do we do four? Yes. So we're going to do question number four and explore that as we move um, uh, towards the end of our time with the panel. So question four is, what is the responsibility of the community or your organization to student achievement? So we've, you know, we've had some small debates in class, and, and I know you all have spent more time on this in, in other ways, around like what even is achievement? 
You know, so there's that philosophical piece of what is achievement. You know, we might measure it one way as a state, um, but there's a lot of other ways that goes. Well, what we would like to look at is what is that responsibility of, of the community or the work that you're doing towards helping students succeed? Another way to take that might be, yeah. we've done a lot of heavy reading in this class, mm -hmm. where we, we've heard a lot about social problems and the ways that certain children are marginalized income and language and ethnicity and so many other factors can get in the way. And as a classroom teacher, that can be really overpowering to think I've got to fight all these battles. Um, <coughs> what is the community's obligation to those teachers to be a partner or an ally? And what would you like teachers to know what's out there, what you can provide, what other people need to provide? So, I mean, that's a lot of stuff, I but I think that. it's also yeah. related to the same issue. We, want, we all want students to achieve. Teachers often feel alone. You're there to help. Yeah. How can the community right. be an ally for right. teachers, yeah. right, in the work that they do? Uh, is Peak to Peak Charter School represented here at all? We think we have somebody that penned it as a student. As a well, student, yeah. Peak to Peak Charter School hired the Statewide Parent Coalition to help them develop a parent leadership team of Latino women. Peak to, and, and this is this is really interesting because if you look at the enrollment of peak to peak, uh, it's pretty much white. I think there's about maybe eight percent of the enrollment at peak to peak is Latino. But there's a couple of teachers at peak to peak that had the the uh, like that the wither with all to want to do something because. Uh, peak to Peak is probably the best school in the state of Colorado, according to statistics and everything that you read, okay, as it relates to achievement. But they do have a population in there that is small, so small that if these kids are not doing well, it doesn't even register, okay. Uh, but the teachers and the administration at Peak to Peak says, no, we gotta do something. We gotta bring the families there to help us and help our teachers. So they created this, 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 or they wanted us to create this parent leadership team so that they could help the team, parent leaders, come and tell their stories to the rest of the organization or the rest of the teachers as it related to what are some of the issues, you know, those kinds of things. How can they be more helpful? Da, 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 da. So that's that's one way that this one particular school is doing it. St. Brain Valley School District. Anybody here from St. Brain? No? So mostly, mostly Denver and Boulder. St. Brain Valley School District uh, also hired the Statewide Parent Coalition to develop parent leadership teams in all of their Title I schools. I think there's about seven Title I schools in St. Brain. So, we did the same thing, and with, with the support of the parents, because they, I think the schools that do this, they get it, that teachers cannot do the work by themselves. They need help, they need support, and the only way to get it is to open the arms, you know, and, 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 and invite the people that they're really trying to help. This, this whole saying of, don't do for me without me, goes a long way because that's what schools are thinking now is if we're going to do for you we can't do it without you you got to come and help uh, so that's one way and and uh, and we even did that at Sanchez uh, when Doris was there uh, we created a parent leadership team there's a lot of things that schools can do if they just reach out to the community there's community organizations that will be glad to help and provide resources to the schools and to teachers. So all you gotta do is Google <laughs> and you'll find organizations that can be helpful. Our organization El Paso believes strongly in the uh, the work of parents. The parents have to be and we talk about this all the time, the parents are the first teachers. Yeah, but if the teacher hasn't been prepared, nobody has 
taught the teacher how is she or he uh, going to do a, a good job. So our, our job is to give the parents the tools and the information for them to be able to start working with the little kid. And I'm saying working. I mean playing with the child, reading to them, singing, dancing, counting, explaining the world around. Things that your mom and dad did when you were a little kiddo. And that's why you are here. And that's what we want for our families. If the families have the, the skills and information, they just go crazy and they really are like sponges. We have this incredible, wonderful uh, program where for three years we get moms and dads coming to our, our, our uh, training and they give, in, they give him, uh, get information about what to do with math. You know, counting as you skip and counting the, the windows, whatever. And all those activities that are just games and games and games and read and read and read. I love to hear the parents when they say, I can't believe it. My child likes to read. Who knew? <laughs> when you read to the child and you show that, that you like it, the children also like it. That's one way our parents, they turn around in their program El Paso, they turn around and they invite their community, their friends in the neighborhood, and they, they invite them to come in here into their home and they share what they have learned in El Paso. So that's one way we are working in, in supporting education, closing the famous achievement gap. Yes. Um, yes. I know that the teacher, we don't have the time to go to visit our, you know, the students' houses and things like that, but something that we do at um, the beginning of the year, and actually in my program too, is that we don't wait for parents to come to the school, we go to their homes and meet with them, and, and especially for parents that uh, they, they don't come to the school, we make the effort to go there and provide the services that they need in the houses. That is another way that, uh, rather than way that they come, we you know, participate in the community. Great, thank you. So responsi yeah, responsibility to schools. Yes, we at the University of Colorado, I'm the pedagogy professor for the department, and so I teach all the graduate and undergraduate courses in pedagogy for dance. I have every semester about 30 students who need experiences going out to teach in the community. So if you would like to contact me through that website that I gave out, the button goes right to my personal email. I am, I have a team that would just love to come do uh, cognitive development and movement ex exercises and performances for you or to have your students come to us because we already have the facilities and the space. Uh, so we can usually facilitate either once we sign waivers and releases and all that good stuff. And uh, then I have my, myself, <laughs> team of one, always happy to come do presentations. Uh, I have a philanthropic company called the Sovereign Collective, so use us, please. And if we're unable to do it, we'll, we can usually refer you to other organizations that we're connected to. My organization focuses on North African, Arabic, and West African dance mixed with hip hop and electronica. So it's a mashup form. Um, so we do a lot of international hip hop and rap, but uh, we have ballerinas, we have Fokoloroko dancers, we have um, Irish step dancers, we have all kinds of folks um, in our realm. So please let me know if I can connect you with something. Overwhelm me, I would beg for it. Overwhelm me with requests. She's just such a great example yeah. of what that means, you know, the partnership, and there you just have to ask. And so I think um, one of the things I'm most proud of in my educational career is the Family Resource Center, and it, which ultimately became a 21st century learning center at Sanchez, which connected over 200 partners with that school. 200 partners from the community, from a grandparent to the University of Boulder to Front Range Community College to 
Intercombio to El Paso to, you know, there's just, it's thinking about, yes, I'm a classroom, and then you, as the power of one in your classroom, create these outreaches. And then if your school's not that kind of school, then you go to the principal and say, hey, I just found that I could make all these connect. Couldn't we do that as a school? And then that grows. And so just that power of one teacher in one classroom connecting with your parents, the parents of your students, and then connecting with community, that how that could actually grow and then be that ripple effect that could affect a whole school. And so I, um, I just was thinking about, wow, you just hear that. And I, I wouldn't have known that. So I think you just have to start asking and building networks of support around your little classrooms that then could potentially impact the whole school. And then the last thing, you know, achievement to me, I've always been an advocate of that whole child. And that child is not just about academics. It's about the social and emotional wellness of that child. And I think it's all encompassing that that parent is that connection. And it might be a parent, it might be a grandparent. And I think we need to think about parents differently because there's lots of different kinds of parents for children today. And we have to be really careful that it's not just mom and dad. No, there are two moms, there's two dads, there's one mom, there's one dad, there's grandparents, there's aunts and uncles. And so we have to really be careful that we're not just focusing on moms and dads kinds of things because there's many different constructs of family today. And um, I think we, we just need to be conscious of that. I'll just kind of wrap up what I think we will, what I think was said and what I would believe is that um, community organizations really serve to fill a gap. So where um, public or private schools uh, can't um, or, or don't have the resources to, and I don't think they, I don't think it's the responsibility of the schools to provide the entire network that we need. Um, for, for kids to achieve. I think it's a, it's a community responsibility. Um, and so organizations um, like Intercambio and uh, University of Colorado and Mental Health Partners, we are, and El Paso, Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition, we are here to fill, uh, fill needs that are not being met. Um, so, so as educators, you should see us as that. You know, we wouldn't exist if there were not gaps that needed to be you can Google us, Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition, and uh, we do have a website. It's a good one. I've been looking at it while you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> nice website. Well done. El Paso also has a website. A new one, website. just born like three days ago. <laughs> Please look at it. You know, the other thing, too, just a little bit of statistics before you all, before we no, wrap please. it up. In the state of Colorado, there are about 450,000 children between the ages of zero to six that both parents are working. There are 162,000 licensed child care slots in the state of Colorado. So if you do the math, the majority of the kids are not in licensed child care centers. They are in what we call family, friend, and neighbor child care centers, uh, yeah. homes. Uh, the family, friend, and neighbor network exists everywhere. If you do the math, there's about 20,000 FFM providers in the state of Colorado. Many of them are caring for kids and they care for two to three or four kids in their home. These are the kids that are going to enter the kindergarten classrooms when they, when they turn five years old. Many of them may not be ready for kindergarten because some of these particular providers do not have the training nor the skills to be able to provide a quality uh, care system for them. What these particular FFM providers have is the heart. They want to do what's best for these kids, they, but you know they, they're concentrating more on making sure that they're fed and they're well taken care of. They're not thinking about social emotional development. They're not thinking about cognitive development. They're not thinking about all of these wonderful things that the kids need to have when they enter kindergarten. 
The Statewide Parent Coalition developed a program called Providers Advancing Student Outcomes, PASO. It's not El Paso, it's PASO. And this particular provi program provides FFN child care providers with 120 hours of training. When they finish the training, these providers are now able to apply <coughs> and, and, and try and get Child Development Social Credential, which is a national credential that puts them a, a step up in terms of their own skills uh, as it relates to other family care providers. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we, you know, when you're talking about filling the gaps and all of that is what we, what we started doing through the Statewide Parent Coalition is because we know there's a heck of an achievement gap. Some people prefer to call it an opportunity gap. There are kids that are dropping out of school that are not finishing high school. And there are kids that psychologically drop out when they're in middle school. So when you look at these particular kids, often I have to ask and remind people is, you ask the question, who are these kids? Who are we talking about? And once you get the answer of who you're talking about, then I think you have ways to fix the issue and, and, and work on the problem. El Paso was born because we were trying to do all kinds of work to close the achievement gap in Boulder County. We were doing all kinds of wonderful things, but nobody ever asked the question, <coughs> who are the kids? Who are the kids we're talking about? Who are the gap kids? If it, if it wasn't low-income Latino children, that are the gap kids in Boulder County. So once we identified that, then we knew what we had to do. We knew that we had to create the Apostle program. We knew that we had to work with parents. We knew that we had to provide parents with a lot of different types of training and leadership skills so that they could be the children's best and their best advocates for the, for, for the, for the kids. And that means working with schools, working with teachers, working with systems. But um, the way they did, they did it was they actually have like seven or I don't know how many town meetings where they ask the parents, the Latino community, they ask them, what do you need? What do you see the problems are? So you see, even to, for uh, the creation of El Paso, he, uh, they, uh, the community foundation uh, followed their own advice. They went to the community and asked, what do you need? What the problems are? Please tell us. Yeah, anyway. Love it, love it. Okay, um, we are exactly at 7.30. <laughs> that is amazing, wonderful. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And this is so, I think I mentioned that all of these students are graduate students who will be graduating in August with their masters, Yay. yeah, for university, yeah. from Boulder Journey School yeah. Pro Teacher Alternative Licensing Teacher Program mm -hmm. that is in partnership with the University of Colorado Denver. Mm -hmm. And their work is absolutely amazing. Um, so we're very, very fortunate that they are working working with young children and continuing in the field. Yeah, great. Bravo. Great. great. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're, we're going to take a 15 minute break for everybody. If you're on the panel, you can definitely leave. But if you want to use those 15 minutes to snack something very quickly on the panel, you have to call Big request. You can certainly do that. Otherwise, we'll be back in your 15 minutes to set up some time. So, I was just diagnosed with um, a degenerative muscular dystrophy. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, my program that I started is the Office of the Child Adoption and Relationships. My dream is that we start licensing many school for the child educators. I guess that's the year.